Hello, and welcome to Kickstart. Today, I am joined by VP of Design and, S- and Experience at ThoughtSpot, Alonzo Canada. Alonzo, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so I've done a little bit of research on ThoughtSpot, and you guys are doing some pretty incredible stuff with business intelligence platforms. Mm-hmm. Can you talk to us about the company and your role within? Yeah. So ThoughtSpot is a data company, and we have a very simple vision. We want to make it very easy for anyone to get insights from data. And as you know, the world is producing more and more data. Yes. Mark Andreessen, famous venture capitalist, said that software is eating the world. And the byproduct of that is data. Yeah. And so we now have more and more data, and yet it's extraordinarily difficult to mm-hmm. work with it and get insights from it. And so we have taken an approach where we just want to make it blazingly simple. Mm-hmm. So anyone like you or me can get insights from data about things that we care about. I might be a marketing manager at PNG. I might be a product manager at Pinterest. I might be um, a supply chain manager at Amazon. And there's all sorts of kinds of data that I care about that I need to know in order to run my business. And rather than spending hours on end or working with an army of data scientists, we make it very easy through a few simple clicks to allow you to get insight about things that are relevant to you. Yeah. So the interesting thing to me here is you're a design guy. Yes. You're a creative guy. Yes. But you're talking to me like a data scientist. Yes. And we're at a very interesting um, time with AI where you don't have to be a data scientist to take the value from AI. Mm-hmm. And it's being woven into platforms and processes where it can help sales, it can help marketing, it can help finance, it can help operations. So how, from a design perspective, are you guys approaching that thought? Yes. So we want to, um, we, so part of the design challenge is making data very easy to understand Mm -hmm. and basically taking it out of the realm of statistics, right? And making and putting it into plain English, plain charts so that you actually understand it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so. Part of it is very much a, it's like a content design problem, yeah. right? So how do we take this complicated content and distill it down to the very essence so that if you say, hey, ThoughtSpot, you know, what are my sales today? Mm-hmm. And you happen to be driving in your car, we can basically just kind of read that thing out for you. Yeah. And then it might show up on your phone as a mobile notification. You can click into it. If you want to get like more detailed analysis about kind of what, what's happening, mm-hmm. all those progressive layers of content or information are going to be there. And what's amazing about our stack is that we kind of we go down to this row level data, right? So the actual real data that sits in these giant databases of you know billions and billions of calculations, et cetera. If you want to go down to that level very quickly, you can do that. But mm-hmm. most people want to know, like simply, like what do I need to know today? Yeah. And so that's the level that we're trying to do. And basically it's kind of a, it's a content design problem, mm-hmm. right? So it's just like, you know, like if you're at the New York Times or you're at CNN or you're at BuzzFeed, like how do you basically design this content in a way that's going to be super engaging and easy to, uh, to consume? Mm-hmm. So it almost seems like you're approaching data as content. In many ways, it is content. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Can you sort of yes. speak to that kind of approach? Because I don't think most people intuitively think of data as content, right? Yes. They think of it as data. Yeah. So we like the way that um, the way that our one of the ways that our AI works, right? So again, you might be say a brand manager mm-hmm. at PNG, and so the thing you care about is selling Dove soap, yep. right? And so to do that, you're going to look at your sales of Dove soap in different regions and different stores. You're going to run different campaigns to kind of drive promotions of that. You're going to have different product launches, brand launches, et cetera. And so you want to see how all these different things perform. You're going to look at basically sales numbers and like profitability. And so you might have a, um, a, um, a key metric around, um, you know, number of units sold across, uh, North America. Yeah. So the way our thing works is like, you can basically, you can click on that. And you can say, I want to watch this thing. And then after that, we will basically kick off like AI analysis on a daily basis. And so if there's anything that's kind of causing those things, that those sales to go up or down, or if you see a spike in, let's say, Miami, Florida, as opposed mm-hmm. to New York, we're going to basically turn that into a piece of content, right? Like yeah. sales of Dove soap are up by 25% in, in, in Miami and down by 12% in, in New York and basically almost make it like a news headline. Mm-hmm. And so it kind of flows into your phone. You can see this thing. And then if you want to, again, kind of see a trend or whatever, you can click into it. You can get into the actual visualization. If you want to ask follow-up questions because we have search, you can, you, can, you can do that as well. That's very cool. So as VP of design and experience, what kind of problems are you facing on a day-to-day basis? Mm -hmm. 
So we have a we have a fairly big platform. Mm-hmm. So we've got um, you know so we we have search, we have mobile, we have uh, we have AI, um, just to name a few. Yeah. And um, so a lot of these, um, it's really a blending of kind of art and science, you know, engineering mm-hmm. and design, and how do we um, you know how do we craft a vision? How do we um, how do we you know, use empathy in terms of uh, understanding our different kinds of users? Because mm-hmm. with our, a product like ours, it needs to um, it needs to work for someone like you and me. Yeah. But we also need um, experts. We mm-hmm. need data scientists, or we need analysts who are also able to do fairly complicated uh, things in the product as well. And so we have to figure out where do we want to dial the the experience yeah. across these different uh, uh, different personas. And then work hand in hand with engineering to figure out like how do we how do we deliver on this experience and what is like what's capable what's possible mm-hmm. um, and so there's a real tight partnership that we have between design and engineering to figure out how to do this. So is that sort of a, a natural approach that you've always had this analytical uh, quantitative approach to data and research and then applying that to your design or is that something that you kind of had to develop over your like professional experience yeah so it's um the uh, the blending or the combination of engineering and design which I think is what your question is, yeah. is um, has always been it's part of the company's DNA mm-hmm. and so one of the like thought spot was founded on this notion that like why can't you just search data like you can yeah. Uh, the way you do online yeah. with Google, right? So how do we deliver a Google-like experience with data? Mm-hmm. And so in order to do that, it needs to be super fast. Mm-hmm. And, and so these other systems, these legacy systems are not, like they literally, they're, they're very slow. And yeah. so um, our technical architecture is engineered for speed because in order to deliver on that Google-like experience, yeah. it has to be fast. And so it's very much, again, it's that blending of design and engineering that is uh, part of our DNA and how we think about uh, achieving our vision and you know, designing a product that's going to hopefully be useful for millions, if not billions of people. Yeah, no, it seems like it's well on its way. Um, so you're spe- you spoke a little bit about the DNA of ThoughtSpot, mm-hmm. and I'm kind of curious, how do you foster a uh, culture within ThoughtSpot? that has this data-driven approach to design and the user experience in general. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the, the data-driven approach that we tend to take is um, it's both qualitative and quantitative, mm-hmm. right? So we um, so the qualitative side is uh, that's where we do things like we interview our users, we conduct ethnographies, we try and create a culture of open empathy, mm-hmm. right? So we understand our customers and their needs and their mindsets inside out and so we do things where we have customers come in and they share with us what they like about ThoughtSpot, what they would like to improve about ThoughtSpot, how they use ThoughtSpot. Um, we go talk to our customers all the time and try and understand um, like their different users and, and, and how they how they use ThoughtSpot. Whenever we develop new features we basically we have a lot of um, feedback loops mm-hmm. right so we'll even like We'll even draw up simple wireframe concepts and ask customers for for feedback on that. We do a very you know detailed kind of interactive prototypes and get feedback on that. So we really try and have as much as many feedback cycles as possible before yeah. we before we uh, release a, a a product. The quantitative side is very much kind of going in and looking at you know like understanding quantitatively like you know how are people using different parts of the feature mm-hmm. or different features. And then based on these behaviors that we will see through quantitative data, we will then um, extract those out and then potentially go and talk to our users to understand um, kind of what's going on with that. So and this is designing for the human is kind of yes, the approach there. Yeah. Absolutely. It's all about like a human centered approach to yeah. design and trying to, you know, again, design, mm-hmm. you know, design a data product for everyday folks like, like you and me. Yeah. Um, so everyday folks like you and me can kind of be scared by technology and data and privacy, um, and it can be a little overwhelming. Mm-hmm. So how do you build trust through AI in your platform? Yes. So designing for designing for data and mm-hmm. AI on some level starts with trust. Yeah. And we live in a world today where I think there's increasing distrust around AI. As we look at privacy breaches, and we look at um, you know some big companies who maybe kind of 
collecting signals about um, our whereabouts and our behavior and maybe yep. in ways that people may not have agreed to. Yeah, or, it feels or, invasive. Or they, yeah, yeah. It feel, feels invasive, mm-hmm. but might feel comfortable. So the need for trust is, is, is high, mm-hmm. if not getting higher. The other thing that we find that's unique about data is that um, it's really important that um, you trust the calculations. Yeah. Right. Is that the right data set? Is it a is it is the data complete? Is it the right data? Mm-hmm. Um, is it whatever the most recent data? And are the calculations correct? So is it accurate? Mm-hmm. Right. So you have to we have to like communicate this notion of accuracy. Um, we also work real hard to communicate to be transparent. Yeah. About what's happening under the hood. Mm-hmm. So rather than treating AI as a black box. We want to make it transparent, mm-hmm. right? So, how many calculations were were, were, were used here? Um, where's um, where is this data coming from? What kind of algorithms are we using? Now, most people like you and me may not care about that, mm-hmm. but if we want, to, but if you wanted to learn more about that, there's ways for you to do that in our product. If you're someone who is more technical, you can basically go in and there's knobs. You yeah. can basically kind of dial in. You can. You can say I want more of this algorithm or these different kind of parameters, and you can you can kind of tune yeah. the system to your liking. Yeah, that was one thing that I thought was very unique about your platform was when you do a search, um, it shows you what question was being asked and the algorithm that yes. was used to determine that. Right? Yes. What was the obviously transparency was the thought behind that? Yes. Can you kind of talk about the. Um, the design thought of integrating that into the platform. Yes, so it's. Um, I mean, it's pretty simple, right? I mean, we uh, again, it's um, it's um, it's a philosophy um, mm-hmm. that we have. Like, it's a it's a principle by which we design our products. So we have a set of yeah. product principles that we uh, that we use to help us, you know, guide our t- strategic decision making. Yeah, please I describe those. I will. Um, but um, and so transparency is, is mm-hmm. one of those. So one of our key principles is the notion of, of, of build trust, and underneath that is uh, you know needs to be secure. Yeah. It needs to be transparent. It needs to be accurate. Mm-hmm. It needs to be relevant. Is mm-hmm. the other thing, right? So um, that's another unique property of our system. So based on your searches and um, you know, different insights that you look at in the system, we will recommend things that are unique to you, mm-hmm. right? So you might again, you might be a brand manager at PNG and you care about those. So I might be a brand manager at uh, at PNG and I care about Old Spice. Yeah. Right, and so ThoughtSpot will give me insights about Old Spice and not Dub because it's going to look at my history, and I can even like tell th- tell it things that I'm interested in and get more insights mm-hmm. um, like that. So this notion of relevancy is also important. Yeah. So that's one. So so build trust is one. Mm-hmm. Um, another one is um, we talk about this notion of um, be familiar yet new. Mm-hmm. And so this is an idea where we try and leverage um, existing patterns from other products out there to make a product like it's about data feel more understandable and more familiar. So the new part is we do all this magic underneath the hood in terms of like, you know, all, all the AI, but then we try and present it in very familiar ways. Mm-hmm. So for example, um, you know, we have a sort of like a, a Facebook like feed uh, that basically is suggesting, recommending different kinds of insights for you. Okay. And so yeah. that's intentional, right? Yeah. We want it to feel familiar. Oh, like people understand. I've been concept. here before. Yeah. I've been here yeah. before. I understand that. What's different is instead of it being a post of your friends, you know, about photos or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. It's actually it's something about your business that has to do with, with Dove Soap. That's cool. Yeah. Is there any way you can integrate my Facebook feed into there as well? No, okay. there's not. Yeah. <laughs> um, so can you talk to me about the future for ThoughtSpot and how you guys are going to kind of remain at the forefront of AI and technology and all these innovations that you guys currently are at the forefront of? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we, I mean, again, we have a we have a simple vision, mm-hmm. um, but a, a big vision, and we believe that um, – Due to our, you know, our architecture and our and our UI UX, that we have the ability to be this, you know, this layer of this layer for data, right? That um, basically is going to use AI to uniquely find these insights and then deliver it mm-hmm. in the right time, in the right place, in the right way to in different individuals. So that can be in your car. Um, it could be imagine your your Google Home or your Apple HomePod. You ask, you know, hey, hey, ThoughtSpot, what I need to know today. Mm-hmm. It's going to spit out uh, spit out all these different insights. Yeah. Um, yeah, obviously mobile and desktop. 
So we, our unique ability is to aggregate all this different data and then um, use our, our AI and our algorithms to basically suggest and recommend insights to you that you wouldn't even think to know of. And so we believe, again, like this can be a layer that can be uniquely applicable to big companies, small companies, individuals, and, and teams. Awesome. So being a show based around um, startup culture, and you obviously your focus is in design and experience, can you talk to me about design and experience in a startup and how you sort of approach that? So a startup is, yeah, so I can, so design in a startup mm -hmm. um, looks different depending upon the stage of the startup. Yeah. So obviously, you know, early stage, it is, uh, you know, you're very much trying to figure out what your vision is and mm -hmm. find product market fit. Uh, versus later stage, you are more focused on scaling. And so the way that design shakes out is different uh, in those different phases. So what's great about um, using design as a lever to help you find product market fit is that um, design is very good at um, helping people creatively come up with a lot of different ideas mm -hmm. and then basically turning those into experiments, kind of lightweight experiments that you can quickly take to a set of users, a set of you know, uh, customers, et cetera, and get feedback and figure out like what is working versus not working. Mm -hmm. And this approach can be used not only in the design of product, but it can be used just in the, the design of the overall business model. As yeah, well. yeah. And so I think strong design leaders can work with founders to leverage this kind of approach to more rapidly find uh, product market fit. So speaking to the design in terms of a business model, how do you, sort of being at the top of design and experience at ThoughtSpot, how do you create a culture based around your creative process? Yes. So one of the things I, in terms of uh, creativity, yeah. and uh, so again, startup is, um, it's about both creativity and execution. Mm -hmm. You need both. Um, and you can't just brainstorm forever, right? Yeah. I mean, you actually need to build something. Oh, through market, something, right? yeah. Um, but it's... Uh, Creativity is something that uh, it's a muscle and it can be taught, it can mm -hmm. be practiced, and it's not just the providence of designers. Yeah. And I think like, strong design leaders will work with their teams and help them uh, come up with the best ideas, like tease out the best ideas. Mm -hmm. And so we do things like design sprints and brainstorming sessions, and we really we get introverted engineers and um, very tactically minded, you know, product managers yeah. to you know spend a couple hours and loosen up and um, think about the problem in a number of different ways and just like you know start generating ideas. Yeah, and a very be, free thinking kind. Very of Very free thinking. Yeah. We can go, we can whiteboard things. We yeah. can draw things up on post its. There's exercises that we do to mm -hmm. um, it lowers uh, people's thresholds about what good looks like in terms of their drawing abilities mm -hmm. and get them to basically generate a lot of different uh, different ideas. Because one of the things that um, creativity is about is really um, quantity yields quality. Yeah. Right. So if you're able to come up with 100 ideas as opposed to just 10, mm -hmm. most likely that 90th or 93rd or 95th idea is going to be a lot more creative or interesting or compelling. And sometimes those are, those are the uh, best ideas. Yeah, it takes refinement to get yes. to that level. And so what you want to do is you want to help people turn that, when you're brainstorming, turn that judgment part of the brain off. Mm -hmm. Right, so there is no such thing as a stupid idea. Yep. Right, you want to encourage those those wild and crazy ideas. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're um, you're able to frame that uh, this is a set of exercises that are going to help us you know, rapidly explore a wide range of options, and then you know we need to execute. So we're going to pick the best. You know, we're going to try and pick the best ones, and we'll narrow in and begin to build prototypes and, and uh, uh, test those with people. So people sort of understand at a high level kind of what that process is. Then they, you know, they they know kind of when to kind of get execution minded versus mm -hmm. when they should just kind of be free for it. And it's really tough. Yeah. So, all right, I have one last question for you, and this one's this is a tough one. Um, would you prefer uh, Bluebird corduroy ski runs or backcountry powder in a uh, crazy storm? Oh, that's like not a tough one at all. Um, 
corduroy uh, groomers versus backcountry powder. Yeah. Like backcountry powder any day. Any day? Oh, yeah. That's like my sweet spot. I love to go skiing. Amazing. This year was phenomenal. Yeah. We Miracle had, March. It we happened. Had, like, <laughs> like incredible. Some mm-hmm. of the best skiing I've done in Northern California has mm-hmm. happened this year. I've been out here for like 20 years. And uh, we had some amazing light fluffy dry powder days up to your waist yeah, yeah that's awesome. like i love that yes well it's still pretty early it's thursday i think we could uh bail out and head up to tahoe what do you say yeah there's uh there's still lots of snow up there and yes awesome well alonzo thank you for joining us we yes. appreciate it and viewers thank you as well we'll see you next time